Rare has made quite a few racing games in their time as developers, but by far, the most popular one is Diddy Kong Racing, a fun racing game whose story-driven adventure mode set the game apart from the competition. But adventure mode, where did that idea come from? It wasn't exactly something used often in racing games at the time. Well, it turns out that the idea actually stemmed from a different game that the team had been creating at the time. In fact, at the beginning, Diddy Kong Racing wasn't even a racing game at all. So on this episode of Beta 64, I'm going to teach you about the development of Diddy Kong Racing. Diddy Kong Racing's development story begins after the release of Killer Instinct 2. At that time, the team behind the fighting game split into two parts, with one part starting work on Killer Instinct Gold for the Nintendo 64, while the other part began working on a new game for the Nintendo 64. And what was that new game? Well, for the first month of development, it was something quite different from being a racer. It was a real-time strategy game based around time travel and cavemen. After a while, the four Rare employees working on the game, Lee Musgrave, Rob Harrison, Lee Schumann, and Chris Stamper, decided to take a slightly different route. They decided to make it a racing game instead because they wanted to. But in order to keep their game from being a complete copy of Mario Kart, and influenced by the fabulous Walt Disney World, they changed their project into an adventure racing game under the title Wild Cartoon Kingdom, whose adventure mode had a hub world linking together amusement parks. This version of the project impressed the executives at Rare, and the team grew in size to now work full time on the game. These two characters shown here, one a donkey and the other a crab, were meant to appear in Wild Cartoon Kingdom. But once again, the team decided to change their project's direction. This time, the game went under the title Pro AM 64, which technically is a successor to RC Pro AM for the NES, which Rare had also developed. However, Pro AM 64 was going to feature three wheeled trikes instead of the remote controlled cars like in the NES title. Now, like Wild Cartoon Kingdom, Pro AM 64 also happens to have a render of a character in the game this mammoth. You can tell it's from Pro AM 64 because of the trike is riding. Now, interestingly enough, this character was originally going to be in the first version of the project, back when it was going to be a real time strategy game. So that's cool that they were planning to reuse this character from the old time traveling caveman times. But I hear you saying, where's Diddy Kong, the star of the game, the one we're all waiting for? Well, we're, we're getting to that. It turns out that Pro AM 64, by the time July 1997 rolled around, was on the right track for an upcoming release. It had some new characters and even a completed title screen. And with Banjo Kazooie being delayed to summer of 1998, the team was resolute on releasing their racing game by Christmas of 1997. The only problem was that the team knew that the Pro AM IP was not a well known one. I mean, did you know about it? I certainly didn't. So, when they showed Shigeru Miyamoto their game, and he offered to allow them to use any character from the Donkey Kong universe, they had a tough decision. Do they keep their own IP, or use Nintendo's? In the end, they chose to accept Miyamoto's offer, even though they weren't exactly happy about it. But the team knew that having a Nintendo character in their game would obviously help the game's sales. Though instead of picking Donkey Kong, the team chose Diddy, because they felt a stronger attachment to the character. After all, Rare did create Diddy Kong for Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo, and Nintendo was totally okay with this. But after accepting the offer, the team had some work to do. They had to change the game's visuals a bit in order to fit Diddy Kong into the universe, which they were able to do before the game's release in November as Diddy Kong Racing. By the way, can you guess which of these playable characters in Diddy Kong Racing was meant to be the main character in Pro AM 64? It turns out it was Timber the Tiger. In fact, this shirt owned by Martin Wakeley, former designer and producer at Rare, shows off Pro AM 64's logo with Timber the Tiger flying below it in a plane. Poor guy, lost his main character title only to become a side character to Diddy. That's rough. Now back to the present, ish. In 2007, a YouTuber by the name of Alinar Windblade 
uploaded a German VHS tape with promo videos of various Nintendo 64 games. One of these just so happens to be Diddy Kong Racing. I went through all of the footage myself and noted quite a few differences between the VHS and the final game. So starting from the beginning, we've got the entire intro of the game with no cuts and no voiceovers, something that I thought was a myth. But no, the intro is completely intact, but sadly, it's mostly the same. Mostly. At the very start when Diddy and a couple of his pals ride in on various vehicles, Diddy in the VHS gets an extra sound, taking away Pipsies, and Timber doesn't even bother saying anything at all. Take a listen. From that point on, it's all the same until we reach Banjo. Quite a few changes here. If you know Diddy Kong Racing at all, you should notice at the end when Banjo hits Crunch, the name appears as Crash. Now why the change? Well, some people think it's because it sounds like Crash Bandicoot. Whether or not that's actually the real reason, I couldn't figure out, but it is entirely possible. Also, as far as sound effects go, there are two changes when Banjo hits Crunch. One, Banjo's voice is missing in the VHS when hitting him, and two, Crunch's voice sound effect is played before getting hit in the VHS, while the final plays it after. Take a listen once again. Oh, and one more thing. In the VHS, the camera circles around Crunch, but the final doesn't. However, the final does have this cool little circle transition that the VHS doesn't have, so, you know, there's that. At this final scene, the only change I could find is that Wizpig and Diddy's name text is missing, which is an interesting thing to leave out, seeing as Wizpig is the main villain and Diddy is the main character. They just must have not added it in yet. The title screen has a couple of cool differences that should be fairly obvious. That would be the logo and the fact that there's text on the screen that says version 1.964. It's not every day you see the version number of a build in early footage. The only other time I can remember seeing it is when I created my video on Little Big Planet, but I digress. Going into adventure mode, you're giving a nice cinematic that's exactly the same as the final game. However, when Taj appears, the camera zoomed out more in the VHS. The hub world though, not even close to being the same. There's a point in the footage where the player is racing Taj around the island in a plane, so we get a very good look at everything. So let's compare the vast differences, shall we? But before we begin with the layout, you should know that the player in the VHS is going to be collecting rare coins instead of Nintendo 64 flags in this island race. In fact, the player will be collecting a lot of rare coins in almost all of this footage we'll be looking at, but I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, let's get started. At the beginning, both the VHS and the final version seem the same. I mean, both have the same lanterns after all. But just wait, there you go. Instead of coming out in a winter wonderland, you are now in an early snowflake mountain, which neither has snow nor flakes. Keep going straight and you'll eventually arrive at the snowy part of Snowflake Mountain. Fly under a few objects and you'll reach the tropical part. Now fly to the left, and finally, the final game and VHS footage match up again. The footage cuts here, but from the last frame it seems that the rest was going to be the same, probably. I mean, I can't say for certain about that part, but what I can say for certain is that Dino Domain had a big change too. To preface, in the final game, to reach Dino Domain, all you have to do is go up this ramp and you're there. But in the VHS tape, there's a whole new area for the place, complete with its own little ramp. Also in Dino Domain, we've got some other changes too. First off, the boss race with Tricky the Triceratops has a longer intro in the VHS tape. And the Fire Mountain minigame has the balloon move to the right rather than the center as the final game has it. Now that we've gotten the hub world, minigames, and boss races out of the way, what about the tracks themselves? Well, it turns out that a lot of these tracks don't have any differences, sadly but they do all share some of the same changes, like how the bananas from the final game are rare coins in the VHS accompanied with a rare coin counter. It's likely that the coins function the same as the bananas, raising the top speed of the vehicle until the counter reaches 10. A couple of the item's icons have changed too, like the red rocket, which is more zoomed in, the magnet item's border, which is yellow instead of purple, 
and the small boost icon, which is totally different with a green N in a yellow circle, though it does function exactly the same in both versions. The last difference that's the same with all tracks happens to be when finishing a race. In the VHS, when the player finishes in first place, the same placement icon you see the whole race is shown alone in the middle of the screen, while in the final, a completely new, much more impressive logo is shown. Now since we're already looking at the track Snowball Valley, we might as well look at some of the changes that are here. First off, notice that the HUD map is blue instead of red. I personally think that the change to red was made because the blue map could easily get lost in all the snow on the screen. Red, however, is always visible because of its contrast to blue. And speaking of colors, when you take a left at the beginning of this track in the final game, you'll be led straight to a blue balloon. However, freeze frame this part of the VHS and you can clearly see that it was originally going to be a rainbow balloon instead. Next up is Greenwood Village, which only has a couple differences. First, in the VHS, the track is missing a tree on the left side of the first turn. And second, there are two interesting sprites on the wall here, which appear right before the finish line. Can you tell what they are? Turns out they're actually an early logo of Diddy Kong Racing. The last track in the VHS tape with the change is Boulder Canyon, which appears to be missing a bell on a chain near the drawbridge gate. Now why don't we take a look into the wealth of unused stuff in Diddy Kong Racing. Sadly, there's an extreme lack of research when it comes to this game's unused side. Is it lack of interest? Perhaps. But I've looked around as much as I could in so many different places, and this is what I've come back with. I hope you enjoy. As we usually do, let's begin with the unused graphics, starting with the earliest ones, the ones for Pro AM64. There are actually two unused logos of this early version of Diddy Kong Racing. By the way, the black and white one was not meant to be that way. There's just no palette associated with it, so we have no idea how it would have been colored. In a similar way, this early Diddy Kong Racing logo has no associated palette. Now let me ask you, do you recognize this exact logo from anywhere? Because you've seen it before. It turns out that it's the logo that appeared in the VHS tape that we talked about earlier. See? They're exactly the same. And since we're talking about the VHS tape now, the rare coins that were replacing the bananas in the footage are also unused in the final game too, complete with their nice spinning animation. Now back to the subject of Pro AM64. There's a bunch of unused character portraits in the game, three of which weren't finished. Timber, Banjo, and Conker. But isn't there a racer missing, uh, like an important one? Oh yeah, Diddy Kong. That's why some believe that these icons were made and used before the game eventually became Diddy Kong Racing. There's some other various unused graphics in the game too, like a traffic light, a torch with the classic rare googly eyes, presents hanging from a balloon, one, two, and four player text in an unused font, and some token-like things that spell out rare. There's also quite a few early versions of track logos that appeared in lobbies. The first ones are for the tracks of Sherbert Island. They're of Pirate Lagoon, Whale Bay, Crescent Island, and Treasure Caves. All of them are, to be blunt, pretty terrible looking. So they were likely placeholders until the final versions were completed. There's an early logo of the first track in the game too, Ancient Lake. Not only is it a different color, it's also bent too. Pretty interesting but not quite as interesting as the next track logo of Twilight City. But you say, Andrew, there's no track called Twilight City. And you're right, good job, A+. However, there's a track called Star City in the final game that uses the same style as this early logo. But how could I say that these are the same track? They're clearly named different. Well, it turns out that when TT says Star City in the game, the code is referencing a file called Twilight City. So that confirms it. This track logo is an early version of Star City back when it was called Twilight City. And since we're already in future Funland, let's talk about this unused thingamabob thingy. I have no idea what the heck it is, but it sure looks like it would have fit in a future Funland track. In fact, some think that it's Space Dust Alley that was the home of this thingy. Whether that theory is actually backed by any concrete proof, I don't know. Once again, there's not much info on this stuff. But you do know what there's a lot of in these unused graphics? Doors. A lot of doors. We've got a door with a balloon silhouette. We've got a door with a checkmark balloon. And we've even got a door that's an early version of the TT Challenge door in the final game. But you know what's more interesting than doors? Which is difficult to top, I know. It's unused mini-maps of different tracks. 
There are three of these in Diddy Kong Racing, and while we have no idea what tracks the first two are meant to go with, the last one we do. It goes with, well, why don't we get back to that in a little bit, okay? Instead, why don't we move away from these 2D graphics and enter the world of 3D with unused objects. First off, let's start with an unused model of some unknown sea creature. How do we know that it's a sea creature and not just a regular dinosaur perhaps? Easy. Its model ID is called Sea Monster. But something very interesting is that this model has a second model ID as well, named Setup Point. Why is that interesting? Because when viewing a lot of the areas in Diddy Kong Racing with a setup editor, it will show the setup point version of a model, and the position of these models look to be where NPC characters spawn. So perhaps this sea monster was going to be an NPC? It's all speculation, but it's an interesting thought nonetheless. One other interesting thing that you should know is that this character also appears in Jet Force Gemini as an unused model too. As it turns out, there's a ton of other unused objects in Diddy Kong Racing too. However, it's been very poorly documented. So sadly, the next bunch of objects have little to no info about them or even where they would have been used, save for a few. So I'm going to be going through them and if you happen to have an idea of where you think they would have been used, leave a comment below. Okay, here we go. First, we've got an ominous looking door with WizPig's face on it. Next is a sign with a red balloon on it and there's two other signs, one with 60 and one with 30. Now, while those previous objects were pretty generic, the next few here I can guess pretty accurately what their purpose was. Like this hot air balloon, which sports logos of Rare, Nintendo, and Pro AM64. I think it's fairly obvious that it was meant to fly above the tracks before the game eventually became Diddy Kong Racing. And speaking of unused balloons, there's a bunch of them sporting every single playable character in the game, except for three. TT, Conker, and Diddy Kong himself. So why are they here? And why are these three characters missing? I honestly don't know for sure, so I'm not going to speculate and potentially be wrong and start rumors. But with that being said, let's not stop talking about balloons just yet. There's also unused balloons for the numbers 1 through 4. Well, technically they aren't full balloons, all of their backs are missing. So that means they were only supposed to face forward with the camera only facing the front. Think about that. They're number 1 through 4 and meant to appear with a camera only facing the front. Sound familiar? This sounds a lot like the character selection screen. So instead of holding a sign for each player's number, perhaps the balloons were meant to take the sign's place originally. In slightly the same vein as balloons, how about we talk about some unused balloon doors? But before we look at them, I want you to think back to the first door you pass through in the actual game. What do you have to do before you enter it? You have to collect a balloon, right? Because the door requires one balloon. But apparently, it wasn't originally meant to be this way. Check out this unused door. It requires zero balloons, and it's pretty obvious that it was supposed to be the first door you entered in the game, but was replaced with the one balloon door. Why? I believe it's simply design choice. Instead of having a tutorial on how to open doors, by having a locked door as the first thing that faces the player, with the key right next to it, the player can obviously figure it out for themselves. And that's what the team did. And with it, they scrapped not only this zero balloon door, but also this door variation, and this version for Adventure 2. One of the most interesting unused objects in my opinion has to be this spaceship. You may remember in the final game that the lighthouse actually turns into a spaceship in order to take the player to Future Funland. So was this meant to be the actual transportation to Future Funland, or was it just a decoration? I don't know, I just don't know. My absolute favorite unused objects though, have to be these statues. There's one of Whizpig, one of Smokey the Dragon, and one of Tricky the Triceratops. And what do these three have in common? They're all bosses. Now I did read a comment that this last statue might actually have been related to Dinosaur Planet. You know, the rare game that switched to a Nintendo IP and became Star Fox Adventures. Much like how Pro AM 64 switched to a Nintendo IP. Huh. Anyway, he said that this statue looks to be of Tricky from Dinosaur Planet, who was actually originally going to be the same Tricky from Diddy Kong Racing. So there was going to be a connection anyway. I will admit it's an interesting thought, but I just don't know if it holds up. I mean, if it was just this statue in the game, I'd believe it. After all, there are planets depicted on the statue itself. But the fact that the other bosses in the game have the same statue 
It just seems weird to me that the team would take a statue for Dinosaur Planet and just replace the head willy-nilly with other bosses in the game. So to me, it seems more likely that originally each boss was going to have a statue for some reason. But of course, that's just my opinion. I could very well be wrong, but as of this video's posting, we just don't know for sure. Okay, so with that, we're done with unused objects. Now, let's get to some of the most interesting things that went unused in Diddy Kong Racing. Unused tracks. Now, all of the footage I'm going to be showing you of these tracks is being run on an actual console thanks to the EverDrive 64 and a patch available on the cutting room floor. So, to begin, we'll look at one of the more well-known unused tracks in Diddy Kong Racing, Horseshoe Gulch. It starts out normal enough, except the fact that Whizpig is there for some odd reason, flying on a rocket, and plus, he gets a head start, except for the fact that he's coming right back. In fact, none of the racers in this game have any clue what they're doing in this stage. But anywho, as you make your way around the first bend, everything is still pretty normal. Bland, even. Except for this nice, untextured archway. No big deal, just drive right through it. And that's the end. It ends in a dead end. Pretty disappointing. It's not even really a full loop. It's not even a track. You can't even race on it. The next unused and very much unfinished track is this one. It doesn't have an official name to my knowledge, but it's got a lot of waterfalls and dinosaur carvings on the wall, so... For the sake of this video, I'll call it Dino Falls. Because this stage has a ton of water in it, it's obvious that the vehicle of choice was meant to be a hovercraft vehicle. Though, I will say that the water's collision box is a bit, how you say, a little out of place at times. And this arrow that appears on the wall was meant to show you which direction to go, except it's literally carved out of the wall, so you can see and go straight through it. Though it's fairly obvious that if this stage was finished, it definitely would not have been that way. It would have had something there. Going further around the track, you'll be greeted with even higher jumps in the water collision. But eventually, you'll get back to the beginning, as soon as you get up this ramp. Which strangely, is too steep to go over normally, so you have to hop up it. But after that, you're back at the beginning. Despite being very unfinished, this is the most complete racetrack that we have, seeing as it actually does loop unlike Horseshoe Gulch. By the way, remember when I mentioned those unused minimaps a while ago? Well, it just so happens that Dino Falls matches up perfectly with this one. Literally, perfectly. One part is interesting about it though. Apparently, there were two possible ways you could go right over here, but I looked around and only the outer path was there. Here's the thing though, the inner path is there, or should I say, up there. If you're in a plane, you can easily reach the second path, and that's the only way that you can reach it. So that means that both the hovercraft and the plane was meant to be the vehicles of choice on this track. And we figured that all out thanks to a minimap. Thanks, minimap. You're the best. But even though that's the last unused racetrack that's been found, there's a couple of battle stages that still need to be looked over. Let's start with the Lagoon. It's a pretty neat little stage, once again obviously designed for the hovercraft, and it's got some nice little islands, one of which has an anchor in it, and the others I'm going to assume have palm trees on it. But the leaves part of it doesn't load because only the stage objects were replaced to make this unused stage playable in the game. The palm trees also seem to be reusing the same texture as the rocks surrounding the stage, so maybe the level designers didn't even get far enough to add in leaves anyway. One last thing. You may notice that the waterfalls are frozen in time, but that's just because of an issue when replacing the stage. They do work technically, but not with this patch. This next battle stage is completely opposite of the other one. It's full of lava. In fact, it's even got a couple of volcanoes on it too. Now, I know I just said that this was a battle stage, but that's because that's what's commonly accepted. But the more I look at it, the more it seems like a real racetrack. But I mean, I could be wrong. It's just that it's clearly a loop, and there's no big open area like in the last stage. It sounds like a racetrack to me, but I admit I could very well be wrong. At the very least, it's just a different way to look at this stage. I mean, it's pretty small to be a racetrack anyway. Oh, and by the way, if you saw a golden balloon in this stage, that's not actually supposed to be there. It's just a side effect of replacing levels, so just ignore it, okay? This track we're going to be looking at next is actually one of two early versions of final tracks in the game. This one is of a snowy mountain that goes up and up and up until you reach a top finish line. Now, ignoring the trees and obstacles and balloons because those aren't actually part of the track, do you notice anything familiar about this place? Doesn't it remind you a bit of Tricky the Triceratops race? 
It should, because they are almost exactly the same. Even the objects in Tricky's race, like the trees and stuff that's not actually supposed to be there, they still match up almost perfectly with this snowy mountain. It is a bit shorter than the final racetrack, but it's still completely playable-ish. Basically, in order to get it to work, you have to race in a plane or you'll fall at the beginning and get stuck. And you have to race with Smokey the Dragon because he's the only boss that can fly fast enough to not fall at the beginning and get stuck. But once you've got all that, you can race him to the top of the mountain and it will all function as you'd expect. Except, don't cheat and just fly directly to the top. The game will not register that as a win. Now why don't we take a look at the other early track? Technically, it's not a track though. It's actually the Hub World. Yes, there is actually an early version of the Hub World still in the game. In fact, anyone who's played Diddy Kong Racing before has already seen it. It turns out that the intro for Adventure Mode is actually using an early version of the Hub World. How early? Well, I'd say it's closer to the final version than the VHS was because it's almost the same as the final version, but not quite. The trees and bushes are in different areas and it's missing a lot of features, like a lot because the team absolutely butchered this place. Aside from the main area that you see in the intro, the rest is cut up with huge chunks deleted. But it's obvious why they did this. Why would you need to load up the entire hub world for an intro where you only see like a tenth of it? So to lighten the amount of loading to do, they just deleted the parts they didn't need. So even though there's not a whole lot to see, what we are going to see does show a few changes from the final version. First, we're going to go through this snow-covered log which instead of flying into a nice snow covered area will lead us to nothingness. I mean, sure, there is a little bit of stuff like another Taj logo on the ground, but can we really know what was going to be there? Why, yes we do, thanks to the VHS tape. From the little bit that we have left, you can clearly see that it matches up with the early snowflake mountain that we saw before. It's just a shame that so much had to be deleted though. It would have been so much fun exploring the place, but I don't know. It's their game, they can do what they want. A couple of other changes that were found in the early hub is that the log in the main area is missing a section that was later added in, and the path leading to Dino Domain is quite a bit longer and has vines that aren't in the final version. The final unused track to look over is a test stage that's really just a multicolored futuristic cube. Nothing much to see here, but it is interesting to know that this same cube thingy is in two other rare titles, Jet Force Gemini and Mickey Speedway USA. Last but certainly not least, it's time for the unused music tracks, of which there are two. The first is an early version of Crescent Island's theme. Take a listen to the final version and then compare it with the early version. The next, last, and most interesting music track is for the player select screen. Remember in the final game when going over a specific character, the music changes a little depending on who they are. Like for instance, when going over banjo, a banjo starts playing along with the song. Well, there's actually an unused variation of the menu theme that sounds like, why don't you just listen to it for yourself and see if you can guess what character it was meant for. Did you guess? Well, what character did you come up with? I'm listening. Oh, interesting. Well, many people, including myself, believe it sounds like it only would have made sense for one character in the game. That character is Taj the Genie. Does that mean Taj was originally going to be a playable character in Diddy Kong Racing? Perhaps. We can't say for sure though, as always, but it does sound very likely. Especially because Taj was eventually a racer in Diddy Kong Racing DS, and technically he was also going to be a playable character in the cancelled game Donkey Kong Racing. But that's a story for another time. So that's the development of Diddy Kong Racing. To think that a racing game would have this many changes, 
Genres, IPs, and even the entire layout of the hub world were changed throughout development, and it's all incredibly interesting. And even though info on this game's development was all spread around and poorly documented, hopefully I managed to give you the complete picture. That's what I'm here for. I'm here for you. So this has been Beta64 with the development of Diddy Kong Racing. Thanks for watching. Whoa, okay. What is this? Is this one of those end card things? Okay, it's pretty sweet. Oh, look, it's got a link to my previous episode and a link to a recommended one too. Hey, while I've got you here, I actually have a question to ask you. I'm going to be starting a new series of Beta64 episodes in addition to this series, and I need your opinion on what game's development you want me to cover. One, we have Rhythm Tengoku for the Game Boy Advance, whose sequel eventually came outside of Japan as Rhythm Heaven and Rhythm Paradise. Or two, we have Donkey Kong Racing, a cancelled sequel to Diddy Kong Racing. Let me know which game you prefer by leaving a comment down below, and I'll tally it all up and release the video in a couple weeks. Until then, thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you all again soon.